Hello, I'm Professor Jim Pastor, and welcome to Advanced Time Value of Money Concepts. And we'll be taking a look at a few items here. We'll be taking a look at uneven cash flows, and that will include calculating internal rate of return and calculating net present value. And then we'll also be taking a look at calculating amortization, which is an extremely useful calculation to know how to do. So let's get started. Let's now take a look at an uneven cash flow scenario. The statement here is, what is the average compound rate of return that has been earned from investing in an antique chair that was purchased six years ago for $300, repaired at the end of the second year at a cost of $150, and then sold for $850? So what I've done is drawn out a timeline here to depict this scenario. And the neat thing about the timeline is it shows you exactly what happens, and it also shows you what your keystrokes are gonna be, which is great. So we purchased $300 for the chair. That's money leaving our hands. That's gonna be a negative. At the end of the first year, nothing happens. But at the end of the second year, we spend $150 repairing the chair. That'll also be a negative. Then at the end of the third, fourth, and fifth years, nothing happens. And at the end of the sixth year, we sell the chair for $850. And that'll be a positive number because that's cash coming to us when we sell this chair. So this is the timeline and it spells out very neatly what went on. Now to solve for this, we're going to be using the cash flow key on your calculator. And that's depicted by the CFJ key, cash flow. And when you have multiple cash flows that are the, that are the same, where you want to repeat a cash flow, the alternate function is what we call number of cash flows, NJ or Ninja. So we'll also be using that in just a moment. So let's take a look at the calculation itself. So we start off with our $300 going into the chair. We need to change the sign because it is negative, money leaving our hands. That's going to be our first cash flow. Notice at the end of the first year, we have a zero cash flow. So that's going to be our second entry. Our third entry is a negative 150. That's money we're spending to repair the chair. So we take the 150, change the sign, make it negative. That's our third cash flow. And now notice we have, at the end of the third, fourth, and fifth years, we have zero cash flows. Now there's two ways you could do this. You could do this a long way or a shorter way. Either works. Now if we do it the long way, just enter the cash flows. So in other words, at the end of the third year, it's a zero cash flow. At the end of the fourth year, it's a zero cash flow. And then at the end of the fifth year, it's a zero cash flow. So you can see we just enter zero and hit cash flow. That's fine. Now there is a shortcut though for this. And the way you do that is you'd still enter the zero and the, hit the cash flow key. And now you're gonna tell it this happens three times. So you're gonna hit the three key, hit the downshift key, and then hit the cash flow key. The alternate function is ninja, number of times. So now what we've done, rather than going zero cash flow, zero cash flow, zero cash flow, we go zero cash flow, three, downshift, ninja, and now we've told the calculator there are three cash flows in a row that are zero. Either way works. And then finally, at the end of the journey there, at the end of year six, we have a positive $850, and that's our cash flow. All right, so now we've entered everything using our timeline, and now we want to know, okay, what sort of return have I achieved? What's called an internal rate of return? So what you will do then is you'll hit your downshift key and then you'll hit internal rate of return. And when you do that, hopefully you'll come up with 12.54%. So based on spending $300 for the chair at the end of the second year, spending $150 to repair it and then getting $850 after six years, this is my internal rate of return. Now we're going to take a look at calculating net present value. What we're doing here is trying to determine how much we should pay for an investment based upon its cash flows and based upon our required rate of return. So our scenario is this. We have real estate property being offered for $100,000. So we're trying to determine should we pay that or not. And it's expected to have cash flows of $6,000, $7,000, and $8,000 over the next three years. And at the end of three years, we expect it's going to be worth about 115000 So we draw a timeline, makes it very simple to see what's going on. 
Here's our cash flows. At the end of the first year, we have 6,000. At the end of the second year, 7,000. At the end of the third year, 8,000. Also, at the end of the third year, we think the property is going to be worth 115,000. Notice how nice this works with a timeline because at the end of the third year, we have two things going on. We have $8,000 of cash flow, positive cash flow, and we also are going to sell the property, hopefully, for $115,000. We would add these together then. Anytime you have more than one cash flow at the end of a period, you just net them. So by doing this, I'll tell you a common mistake that students will make when they don't do timelines is they may very well enter this, this, and this as separate cash flows and then enter that as a cash flow and then you'll get the wrong answer. So by doing a timeline, you make sure everything's lined up as it should be. Now under this scenario, our required rate of return is 10%. Don't forget then, what that means is we have to put in 10 as our interest rate per year. We're telling the calculator that's our required rate of return. Now it's a matter of entering cash flows. So using our cash flow keys, just as we have before, another neat thing with the timeline, realize that our first cash flow is zero. Nothing happens at the very beginning. At the end of the first year is our first cash flow. So your key strokes are going to be zero for your first cash flow. Then you're going to have a positive 6,000 cash flow, a positive 7,000 cash flow, and at the end, 123,000 positive cash flow. And we want to know, okay, what is our value? What's the value of those cash flows? So what you're going to do is hit the downshift key and then the net present value key. Solve for net present value. And when you do that, hopefully you should come up with 103,651. What that means is if these cash flows occur, if we pay $103,651, we will get our 10% return, which is our required return. Now notice in our scenario, the property is being offered for $100,000. So would we buy it? Yes, because we can buy it actually for less than what we think. If we buy it for $100,000, we will actually get a return greater than 10% because we're paying less than what its value would be based on a 10% required rate of return. And let's take a look at that calculation next. Now let's take a look at calculating what the internal rate of return would be if we paid $100,000 for the property. What that means is we are now going to add this entry. So same timeline as before, we still have those same cash flows. But now rather than starting with a zero here and trying to determine what it would be worth to pay for the property to get our 10% return, which was 103651 we're now going to say, okay, I'm going to pay $100,000 for this property. I'm going to get these cash flows. What's my internal rate of return? So the keystrokes are going to be $100,000. And that's money leaving our hands, purchasing the property. So make sure we make it a negative. And that's going to be our first cash flow. Now we have positive cash flows. So we have $6,000 is our second cash flow. 7,000, the third one, and then at the end of the third year, our final cash flow is 123,000. And now we want to know what sort of return have I achieved. So you're going to do your downshift key and your internal rate of return key. And when you do that, hopefully you'll come up with 11.4%. So in other words, if we pay $100,000 for this property, achieve these cash flows, our internal rate of return on this investment would be 11.4%. Now we are going to do another net present value calculation. And in this scenario, we have inflows, that would be positive money coming to us, and outflows, those would be negatives. So in this scenario here, we have at the end of the first year, a positive inflow of $100. Then at the end of the second, third, and fourth years, we have outflows of $50 each. At the end of the fifth year, nothing happens. And then at the end of the sixth year, we have an inflow of $300. So again, lying out a, uh, or laying out a timeline makes it easy. We can see the keystrokes very easily. And in this scenario, we want to have a 10.5% rate return. 10.5 will be our interest rate per year. 
So by doing the timeline, here are the keystrokes. So our first cash flow will be zero. Our second cash flow will be a positive 100 cash flow. Then the second one here at the end of the second year will be 50, change the sign, and that's going to be a negative cash flow. Same thing for the third year, the fourth year. And notice we do have three years in a row where we have a negative 50 cash flow. So we could do three separate entries, that's fine. But we could also use the ninja key, and that's shown to you down here. So in other words, we could do 50, change the sign, cash flow, and then three, downshift and cash flow, the ninja, the alternate function. And this then tells the calculator we have three cash flows in a row that are a negative 50. So either way, we'll work. Our fifth cash flow here, or our sixth really, at the end of the fifth year, will be zero cash flow. And then our final entry will be 300 cash flow. And now that we've entered all those, we then would just hit the downshift key and we're going to solve for net present value. And when we do that, you should come up with 143.75. Now let's take a look at amortization. In our scenario, we have Ted and Mary Bigelow are planning to purchase a $300,000 home by making a 20% down payment and financing the remainder with a 30-year 7.25% fixed rate mortgage. What will be the monthly payment and how much will the Bigelows have paid in interest and principal by the end of the first year? Before we do our calculation, let's set up the calculator. So first of all, make sure you're in the correct mode. The mode is the end mode. I know lots of times people pay mortgages, they say, oh, I pay at the beginning of the month. But mortgages, auto payments, installment sales, these are all in arrears, meaning you're paying for the previous month. So make sure you're in the end mode. Secondly, set it up for the 12 periods per year. You have monthly payments. And then, of course, clear all and double check that you are set up for the 12 payments per year. Now, the neat thing about the Hewlett Packard 10B2 Plus calculator is that amortization is very easy to calculate and it's a really nifty thing to be able to do because this applies to mortgages, it can apply to an auto loan, it can apply to an installment sale. So the calculation's the same. So let's take a look at this particular scenario. We have the Bigelow's borrowing $240,000. So remember it was 80% of the 300,000. So 240,000 will be our present value. We are gonna have a 30 year mortgage so 30 downshift in will give us 360 compounding periods showing up on the register. 7.25% is our interest rate per year, and then you'll solve for payment. When you do that, hopefully you'll come up with $1,637.22. That's your payment. Now, when you solve for payment, to calculate amortization, you keep this in the calculator. In other words, don't clear anything because the calculator now understands that this is a 30-year mortgage, what the interest rate is, what the payment is, and now we're going to look at the amortization schedule. Now for this particular example, we want to look at the first year of payments. We're looking at the first 12 payments. Now that we solved for payment, which came to the 1637.22, now we can do the really neat part on the calculator, and that's come up with amortization. So we want to look at the first year, the first 12 payments. So we simply enter the number one, then the input key, and then the number 12. So we're telling the calculator we, we want to look at the first through 12th payments. Then the downshift key, and then amortization. You'll notice in the upper right hand corner the alternate function on the future value key is amort. That's amortization. So you just strike that key. At that point you should see 1-12 on your register. So your calculator is telling you you are now looking at the first 12 payments. Now we just hit the equal sign. When you hit the equal sign the first number that's going to come up is the principal that has been paid down. So you should see $2,322.86. Hit the equal sign again, and you will be given the interest that has been paid for this first year, the first 12 payments, 
323.82. And then strike it one more time, the equals key, the equal sign, and you'll come up with the balance that is remaining on the note. So this was a $240,000 loan, and the balance will be $237,677.14. Now if you add this balance here that's remaining to the principal that was paid off, the $2,322.86, that will come to the $240,000. So you can do this anywhere in the amortization schedule. That's what's so neat. So let's say I want to look at just the 12th payment. You do 12, input 12, and you'd be looking at just that one month's payment. Or let's say you want to look at the second year. You do 13, input 24, gold amort. That will then give you what's the second year that you've paid as far as principal, interest, and, re and what the remaining balance is at the end of the second year. So you can look anywhere in the amortization schedule. And again, remember this calculation, it's for home mortgages, it's for car loans, it's for installment sales. It's the same calculation. So it's actually a pretty nifty calculation to be able to do. So that's it. I hope you've enjoyed going through the amortization calculation. And thank you for working through these problems with us in Time Value of Money Calculator class. You did it! On behalf of the College for Financial Planning, I'd like to thank you for attending Calculator class. I hope you found this helpful and useful. And on behalf of the college, I'd like to remind you that we're here to help if you run up against any obstacles or questions concerning calculations. And I wish you all the best in your professional career and your education.